we welcome you this morning. Uh, let me give you a few announcements as we get started. First of all, we do have the envelopes ready. They are out in the hallway, so you can pick yours up. If you do not have a box of envelopes and you would like to have some, call Bailey at the church office, and she'll make sure that you get some of those. Also, this coming Friday, we're going to have a game night up here at the church, uh, unless the snow is just continued to pack in throughout this day. Uh, but we will meet on Friday night, 6 o'clock, bring finger foods for yourselves and for others as well. Uh, but we'll eat together and play games together and just have a good time. We'll meet in the fellowship hall, 6 o'clock on Friday night. And just to uh, let you know that we have scheduled our VBS. It will be June 12th through the 16th. That's a Sunday through Thursday. We wanted to go ahead and give you those dates so you can put that on your calendar, uh, either for your kids to be there or for you to be able to help. So uh, we greatly encourage you to do that. A lot of different things going on. Again, Awana and Wednesday night meals are back on Wednesday night as well as the prayer service. And again, if you're not involved in Awana on Wednesday night and you're not working, come pray with us. We're having some very special prayer times each Wednesday night, and so we would love for you to be a part of that. There's a verse that uh, really hit me this, this week as I was looking at Scripture, and I just wanted to read it to you this morning as we get started. It's in Galatians 4.19. Paul writes, and he says, My dear children, for whom I am again in the pains of childbirth, until Christ is formed in you. I love that phrase, until Christ is formed is formed in you. That's the goal of the Christian walk. The goal of the Christian walk is so that Christ can be formed in us, so that he can take over in our lives. And that's why we worship him. When we worship him, there's a sense that Christ is taking over and he is being formed in us. So that's our prayer today, is that Christ would be formed in you and I. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the joy of worship. Thank you that we get to come into the presence of the living God and give you praise and glory and honor. Lord, there is nothing that we could be doing right now that's any better than worshiping you. You are the King of kings and Lord of lords. You are the Lord God Almighty who is over all. And we come into your presence to worship you right now. We pray for you to come, for you to be pleased with what we do, but God, that you would be honored in everything that we sing, everything that we think, all the words that we listen to, and God, how we apply our heart to Scripture and walk in obedience to you. May it all be pleasing in your sight. Father God, you are welcome here today. And I pray that we would meet with you in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. If you would go ahead and stand with us, we're going to go into our time of worship.
ahead and be seated for us. Uh, this next song we're going to be singing is called Where I'm Standing Now. And uh, it talks about from where people are at now and where they came from and the journey kind of in between. And I was uh, sitting down with a friend of mine this week and we were talking. He said, you know, I had a, a meeting with this pastor friend of mine this week and uh, he was talking. He said, uh, you know, I had this person in our church come up to me and be, just start bashing this guy on their worship team. And uh, so he asked him, he was like, well, what was so bad that they were doing? And he said, well, they were smoking a cigarette. And he kind of laughed and he was like, well, I wish you could have seen what he had been doing and where he's at now because it's so much better that he's smoking a cigarette than what he was doing beforehand. And so kind of where I'm going with this is we tend to judge people before we even see their story. We just see the outer appearance of somebody or some, whatever they're doing right now. And we don't know what they've been through. We don't know how they've gotten to where they are now and where they came from. So in Psalms 147 verse three, it says, he heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. So it kind of just, this song, uh, I guess is just kind of a eye opener for us, especially right now. So I'm gonna go ahead and Of the will 
you so much and just thank you for this morning um, and just your presence and your glory um, that is here in this place and we just humbly come to worship you and we humbly come before your word um, seeking to hear your truth God that does set us free and there is power in your truth and we just come to your word um, and just be with the pastor as he comes to deliver um, that trusted word and we just give you all the glory all the worship in Jesus name we pray amen couldn't help but think as you were singing that song about that's exactly where the Israelites are they're in the wilderness but they were going to the promised land and they could have shouted look where I'm standing now God is a God who changes lives amen he is a God who can do anything. In fact, there is nothing that our God cannot do. I want to encourage you to turn to Exodus chapter 20. Now, I know in Sunday school in our life groups this morning, we studied about the golden calf. We had a, some great discussion going on there, but I could not finish up with the Ten Commandments last week, so I'm going to finish those up this week. So we're going to look at the final six of those Ten Commandments. Now, as we continue looking at them, I want to remind you that these are commandments. They're not suggestions. They are imperatives. These are ten moral laws. Now, whether in other places in Scripture, God gives us ceremonial laws. He gives us civil laws. But these are moral laws that do not change. They are our standard for living with God, and they are standard on how we are to live with one another. What the Ten Commandments do is they reveal the holiness of God, and as we begin to see His holiness, all of a sudden we begin to see our sinfulness and how much we need His help to be able to do what they say. Now, they are not meant to save us. Just because you abide by the Ten Commandments doesn't mean that you are saved, but they are to show us how we are to live with God and with one another, and really what they do is they show us how far short we fall. We saw last week, the first four, they deal with our love relationship with God. God says, if you want to love me, this is what I want you to do. Now, the last six, he's going to be giving us laws, our, our rules that we are to live by so that we can love one another. So let's see how we are to love one another. Would you mind standing as I read Exodus 20, verses 12 through 17? Honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. And again, the neighbor is anyone you come in contact with. It's not just somebody who lives next door to you. You shall not cover, covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male or female servant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Father, as we get into these laws, really just telling us how we're to love one another, I pray that you would speak to our hearts. God, we look at these and we think, oh, I don't, I don't do that. I, I, I don't sin that way. But in every one of these, as we get into Matthew, we realize that we do. And we need your help to be able to overcome this sin in our life, to, to, to go from the wilderness to the promised land. So God, would you speak to our hearts? Would you challenge us with these so that we can confess them, so that we can learn how to love each other more vibrantly? In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Number one, honor your mom and your dad. The word honor means to prize highly, to care for, to give respect to, and it means to obey. Children, young people, and even adult children, this is how you are to relate to your parents. You see, parents have been given a responsibility and an obligation by God for rearing their children, in rearing their children in a way that God wants them to go. A parent is to train, to love, to care for, to encourage, to discipline, and to direct their kids' lives. They have been given authority by God to bring up their children in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Parent, you are a steward of your children. 
And many of the parents that I know are doing the best that they can, and they're being the best parents that they can be. Now, I know when you look at our society, we see the opposite. I know that there are parents out there that are not good parents. I understand there are parents out there that do abuse their children. I know that there are parents that are absentee parents. They're just not there. They don't know how to show love, and they are not there to really care for their kids. But I do believe that many parents are doing the best that they can. So my admonition to you children, and especially teenagers, give them honor. They're not perfect, so cut them some slack. But young people, drop the attitude, get over yourself, and realize that your parents do love you and want what is best for you. You are to honor your parents. It's one of the top ten that we have. So how do we honor them? You honor them by listening to them. You honor them by obeying what they tell you to do. You obey them, or you honor them by seeking their advice. You honor them by loving them, and you show them honor by respecting them and the authority that God has given to you, even when they mess up. But why? Why are we supposed to do that? Number one, because it's the right thing to do. You know, in our society, I think we just teach people whatever's easiest, that's the route that we're to take. No. God always wants us to do what is right, whether it's easy or not. And it tells us here what is right to do is to honor and respect your parents. Secondly, there is the first promise given in the Ten Commandments. If you honor your mom and dad, it says you will live long in the land that I am giving to you. Now, I don't think this is promising living longer but living better and living a more fulfilled existence. You see, doing what God commands will increase the living in your life. So, honor your father and mother. There's a promise with it. And third, what it does is when you honor your mom and dad, it brings stability into the home. Home life gets better. It gets more purposeful and more loving will occur in it. And one last thing before I go on to the next one. Those of you who are adult children now and your parents are getting older, I believe this is teaching us it's your responsibility to take care of your elderly parents. It is your responsibility to come alongside of them and make sure that their needs are being met. We are to honor our parents. So adult children, are you honoring your mom and dad? The second command on how we're to love one another pretty straightforward do not murder now folks if you say that you struggle in memorizing scripture you can have three real quick right here don't murder don't commit adultery don't steal easy that's three verses right there we can memorize this stuff folks listen to me what the mur word murder means it usually refers to premeditated and deliberate acts it describes someone who plans and then takes the life of another it is killing for selfish motivation. And the phrasing, if you really look in depth at the Hebrew, it says literally, never murder. And I think he's making the point that no one has the right to take someone else's life. No individual has that right. And I think what it means as well is that no individual has the right to take their own life. Folks, this command <coughs> seems pretty straightforward to me. Do not murder. But maybe it's just not as straightforward as we think. Because when I look at our society today, it seems like life is valued less and less and less. Examples. We can have more abortion on demand. One man shoots another because they feel disrespected by him, so they drive by and shoot him. We get so angry when somebody cuts us off when we're driving that people are actually killing people for doing that. We kill someone for no reason whatsoever. Nations in our world today are trying to wipe, wipe out whole people groups simply because they hate them. We have religions that are killing others, uh, 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 people of other religions simply because they're not their religion. Folks, we don't value life anymore. If somebody gets in your way, get them out of the way. It tells us here, you shall not murder. 
In fact, I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 5. We're going to look at a couple of passages there. Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 and 22. You know, we often think that the Old Testament is pure law and the New Testament is pure grace. But when we get into what Jesus is teaching, he teaches us even further. He gets into the heart of the matter here. Chapter 5, verse 21 and 22. You have heard that it said of people long ago, you shall not murder. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But Jesus says, I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. He takes it a step further. Not only is the action of murder wrong, taking someone else's life, but he says when you harbor anger in your heart at anyone else for any reason, you are murdering that person in your heart. And he says, goes on to say, you're going to be held accountable for every angry action, every angry thought, and every angry word that you say. And let's just admit it, folks. We are an angry society. This is an angry world. Anger and wrath just seem to spew out of us. We readily attack anyone else who's not on the same page as we are. We attack somebody if they're a Democrat or they're a Republican, are they're white or they're black, are they're vaccinated or unvaccinated. And we get into all these little tantrums against each other, and that's what God does not want us to do. Folks, according to Jesus' words, when we get angry, we have all committed murder in our heart. So maybe this is a sin that we need to confess. And we do. We need to confess it. And what we need to learn to do is to love one another, to stop with the hate, to stop with the anger, to begin to value somebody else's life, even someone you don't like or someone you don't get along with. You are to love them. We are called, even as Christians, to love our enemies. So if there's anyone that you hate, regardless of any reason that you have, and anger is in your heart, there is murder in your heart as well. You know what anger and murder does? It puts ourselves above anyone else. And I think one of the things that all of these commandments are going to be telling us is this. We've got to learn to put others before ourselves. I want you to turn to Philippians. Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 through 5. Listen to what it says. These are the words of Paul, and I call this the humility principle. It says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Are you doing that? Notice what it says. Value. Put them in high regard above yourself. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. The humility principle is simple. Put others before yourself. You are to exalt others even before your own needs. Now, look back at, uh, I will, we'll cover it later. The humility principle. Put others first. We are not to murder, we're not to get angry. Number three, do not commit adultery. This command forbids a married person from having sexual relations with a person who is not their spouse. Now, other forms of sexual immorality are addressed other places in Scripture, like fornication, which is uh, adultery, or, or sexual relations with someone outside of the marriage bonds. These are addressed in other places. Here, it is specifically talking about the married relationship. Now, the reason this is so important about do not commit adultery, do not commit sexual immorality, is because we need to understand that sex is more than a physical act. It is two people becoming one, not just physically, but emotionally and spiritually. There is a bond that takes place when people come together in intimacy. And it is meant, according to Scripture, only for the married relationship. When two people are committed to one another for life, 
and it is to be something that is special and just between the two of them. There's a, a, a beautiful picture of, of, of this context about how important our bodies are in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Everybody turn there. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. This is an awesome passage. Verses 13 through 18. 1 Corinthians 6, 13 through 18. It says, the body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord. Now, listen to what it's saying there. Our body was created to be with God. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and he will raise us also, not just our spirits, but our body. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Y'all look at me for just a second. If you're a born-again believer... If you have Jesus Christ in your heart, your body is a member of Christ's body. Does that make sense? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said the two will become one flesh. But whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Flee from sexual immorality. What that means is run away. Get it as far away from you as you can. Now here's why. Listen to this. All other sins a person commits are outside the body. But whoever sins sexually sins against his own body. You know, in every other sin that we commit, it is against God. Sometimes it's against another person. But when we sin sexually, we actually sin against our own body. It's not to be done. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you've received from God? Now listen to this. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. One of the mantras today is, this is my body. I can do whatever I want to with it. Christ says, no. You are my body, and you are to be united with me. My Holy Spirit is within you, and you were bought with a price. You are not your own. And what he's saying there is you can't do whatever you want to with your body. You belong to me, and your body belongs to me as as well. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. There is to be a purity and a fidelity in marriage. In fact, in the ancient world, adultery was known as the great sin. You know why? Because a pure marriage was the foundation of the created order and society. (coughs) You see, without fidelity... There is not trust in the relationship. And without trust, there is not intimacy. And with, when the intimacy goes... <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> when the intimacy goes, the marriage breaks down. And when the marriage breaks down, the family breaks down. And when the family breaks down, society breaks down. Are we not there today? Is not our society crumbling because of the decisions that we're making? To me, it all stems from the breakup of the marriage, which is causing the breakup of our families, which then breaks up society and dooms a nation. Folks, when you are married, when you commit adultery, you are breaking your promise, your word, and a covenant. It is betrayal on the emotional and psychological level for a couple. And once again in the New Testament, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 27 and following, Jesus again speaks of adultery and takes it to the heart of the issue. He said, you've heard that it said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Adultery begins with lust, which comes from the heart. Lust is an intense, selfish desire for someone else. It is a sexual longing for another individual. It is not love, but it just simply wants to use that other person to please self. And when one lusts, 
When one looks at another lustfully, they are committing adultery, God says, in their heart. And that's just as guilty as adultery. It is using another person's for one's own pleasure. Very succinctly, God just simply says, do not commit adultery. The next command that we are given, do not steal. Stealing is taking something that doesn't belong to you without permission. And just like honoring your mom and dad and murder and adultery, stealing threatens social order and can bring pain into other people's life. For instance, when somebody steals food, they could be taking it away from somebody else who then goes hungry. When somebody kidnaps a family member, it disrupts and tears a family apart. Stealing disrupts the continuity of a society. And church, we steal in a lot more ways than we imagine. For instance, whoever you work for, whoever your employer is, if you are not giving your all, if you're sitting there wasting time at your computer or wherever you are, you are stealing from your employer. We steal when we claim credit for something that someone else has done. We steal when we use someone for our own sake. We steal their security and their self-esteem. And God even says, you steal from me when you don't give your tithe. So stealing can be withholding something from somebody as well. Very succinctly, God says, do not steal. When you steal, you are not showing love to another individual. Number five, do not bear false witness. Now, in a narrow sense, this is in the context of the court of law. When you go into a court of law, you're not to lie when you are up there. You're not to cover something up. But also, you should not refuse to divulge truthful information at a trial. And the meaning is twofold. Number one, criminal behavior should be exposed and dealt with. But secondly, do not get up there and bear false witness that then wrongly accuses someone as well. Society will deteriorate without a good justice system. And the court system of a nation depends on the honesty of her people. Let me say that again. The court system of a nation depends on the honesty of her people. Folks, we're in trouble because there's not a whole lot of honesty that's going on, not just in our court system, but in life in general. So in a narrow sense, it's talking about the, the court of law. But in a general sense, to bear false witness means don't be dishonest. Don't lie. Don't gossip about someone else, especially when they're not present. Don't tell little white lies. You see, society is built upon the foundation of honesty. And Scripture teaches us, so let your words be few. Ephesians 4.29 tells us that we are to let no unwholesome word come out of our mouth. Colossians 3.9 says, do not lie to one another. In Proverbs chapter 10, verse 18 and 19, Whoever conceals hatred with lying lips and spreads slander is a fool. Sin is not ended by multiplying words, but the prudent learn to hold their tongues. Be careful what you say. We are not to bear false witness. We are to be honest and tell the truth in our speech, even if it hurts us. And sixth, to love one another, do not covet. Coveting is the desire or the craving for what somebody else owns or has. And we covet in so many ways. I think part of our coveting is when we try to keep up with the Joneses. We covet so many material possessions. Somebody gets a bigger house, well, we deserve a bigger house. Somebody gets a newer, nicer car, we need a newer car. Uh, somebody has a better job, I deserve a better job. Somebody gets an RV, and so we've got to get an RV or a boat or whatever you want to list. We could go on and on and on. It is desiring what somebody else has for yourself. In fact, you don't want them to have it because you want it. But we covet in other ways. We can covet another person's marriage, their spouse, their children, their family life. 
We can covet another person's success and money. They have it, but we deserve it. I, I, God even convicts me a lot. I, I can covet when I pass by a larger church and I see hundreds of cars outside and I think, you know what, I deserve that. They don't, but I do, and that's called coveting. There are so many ways that we covet. So how do we deal with it? Three things, three advices. Number one, learn to appreciate what you have. Learn to appreciate what you have. Folks, most of you, as I look out at you, you're a blessed individual in a blessed family. Learn to appreciate. Don't keep wanting what somebody else has. Learn to appreciate what you do have. Secondly, learn to be content. You know, we're always striving for more and more and more, and we never have enough, and we just keep going. Learn to be content with what you have. And third, write this down, rejoice with others when they succeed. There ought to be as much joy in our heart when a friend or a family member or somebody else we know, when something good happens in their life, we shouldn't regret it. We should go with them and rejoice with them because success has happened in their life. Again, Philippians, the humility principle, put others before yourself. And every one of these, you can go down the list when we don't honor our mother and father, when we commit adultery, when we murder, when we steal, when we covet, when we bear false witness, it destroys our marriages, it destroys our families, it destroys our society. That's why God gave us these laws, not to hinder us, but to show us exactly what it means to love someone else. Jesus broke down the Ten Commandments in just two phrases. Somebody went up to him one day and said, what is the greatest commandment? And he said, the first is love God. The second one's like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. If we can just learn to do those two things, we have fulfilled the law through Jesus Christ. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you for showing us how to live. And Lord, maybe we don't like to abide by all of these. Maybe we think that we can know better and do better, and we're just going to cut a few of these out. We're going to have, uh, we'll go by six of them. You know, if I can go by six of them, doing pretty good, that's still over 50% now. God, these are all, these are moral laws that we are to abide by because this is how we love you, and this is how we show love to one another. So, God, we come today and just confess we are a selfish people. We are selfish individuals. We always want what we want when we want it. God, please, show us through the power of the Holy Spirit within us, through Christ being formed within us, show us that we can live this way through you. We can't do it on our own. And, and take heed lest you fall. If you think there's one of these you'll never do, we're all capable of any of them. So, Lord... Change our hearts. Change my heart, Lord. I, I, my heart. I, I pray, God, for transformations to occur. And Lord, I pray that we would confess these sins before you. And Lord, you tell us, for those that are believers, when we confess, you wipe it away. You forgive us, and you cleanse us from all unrighteousness, according to 1 John 1 9. So, God, help us. Fill us with your spirit and help us to love you above everything else and to put others before ourselves. God, teach us how to do it. As we remain in a spirit of prayer, I, I want you to, to just ask God, okay, God, which one of these do you want me to do something about? Is there an area in your life that you're really struggling with? Allow the Holy Spirit to point it to you and then say, God, what do you want me to do? And then be willing to be obedient to what he asks you. So go to the Lord and ask him what it is that he wants you to do with this.
God, help me to grow. Change my heart. Change my heart. Conform me into the image of Christ. Jesus, please live more through me. And I pray that for every member that's a part of the body of Christ. right actions, but having the right heart as well. God, forgive us. Help us to represent you better to a lost and dying world.
we close in prayer, I'm going to ask Kyle to come and lead us in our benediction prayer. But you know you don't have to come to an altar. You can come to the altar at any time. That altar can be anywhere. It can be in your home. And I want to encourage you, no matter what you're going through, the trials, the troubles, whatever is there, you can go to the table at any time, anywhere, any place. And I want to encourage you that you allow God to continue to work in your heart. Don't stop thinking about it because we're not, we're leaving here. Now's when the real business comes into play. Will we do what he's asked us to do? Will we represent him well? So continue to be in a, in a, in a spirit of prayer as, as we go from this place because that is our mission too. So Kyle, lead us as we pray. Let us pray. God, thank you.